Bayraktar, Ukraine's miracle weapon that no one saw coming. If you had asked practically any military expert or aficionado before the invasion began in February of 2022 what role, if any, Ukraine's 30-odd drones would play, they would near universally have answered little to none. The most optimistic amongst them may have stated it's used as a short-range reconnaissance aircraft, used to directly support Allied ground forces in uncontested airspace as its most probable contribution. What next to no one would have answered was that it would be seen destroying Russian AAA book systems, or wrecking havoc on long lines of fuel and supply trucks. The Turkish-made drone appears to have become one of those mysterious oddities of war, where circumstance and timing proves all conventional wisdom incorrect, and once more reaffirms the fact that there is always an exception to every rule. But what is the Bayrat car, and why is it so damn special? Good question, one we shall endeavour to answer today by having a look at its development and service history. The Ukrainian Guardian Angel's story begins to the south in Turkey, where the development of what was to eventually become the TB2 started simmering ever so slightly all the way back in the early 2000s when a company named Baikar began investing in tools and technology for the production of small unmanned aerial vehicles. Originally founded in 1984, Baikar, a shortened version of Bayraktar Kardeshler, or uh, Bayraktar Brothers, was a CNC precision machining company which was initially established to help Turkey move away from its dependency on foreign-made precision parts, particularly for automobiles and trucks. This background provided them with all of the technical equipment necessary to start their work, and they finished the production of their first functioning UAV in 2004. This was the Bayraktar Mini UAV. It has no weapons, of course, due to its very small size, but it does have powerful optics, and proved a useful scout for the army which purchased the first batch of them in 2005. After significant field testing, the company eventually produced the upgraded Mini B, which would go on to be used by both Turkey and Qatar in 2012. This first success gave the company a tremendous amount of invaluable experience and design knowledge that let them start work on a much bigger drone in 2007, when Selçuk Bayraktar, an MIT graduate, was hired as the company's chief technology officer. This was an auspicious arrival, because also in 2007, the then Under Secretariat for Defense Industries put out a contract for the production of a tactical UAV, a contract that Baikar won in 2010 with their prototype Bayraktar TB1. And the need for a domestically produced tactical drone was pressing indeed. Turkey had tried pushing for the purchase of US-made Predator drones, but had been refused, as the US feared they would probably be used against Kurdish nationalists. A not at all unfounded fear, as Turkey and a militant Kurdish group called the PKK have been locked in various degrees of outright armed conflict ever since 1984. Now, there were a lot of challengers still ahead before the TB2 could take to the skies. The TB1 never entered mass production itself and remained a testing and development prototype, trying to perfect the formula. Because make no mistake here, creating from scratch a military-grade drone capable of being remote controlled from a great distance and able to transfer high resolution, low latency imagery whilst cruising at 27,000 feet for a day or more is very, very hard. Indeed, it might actually have been so hard that the Turkish company may have taken a few shortcuts along the way. 
but we'll get back to that in a second. The first TB2 made its maiden flight in 2014 and became a great achievement for Turkish military technology. But even more impressive was when in 2015, imagery was released of the TB2 successfully carrying and firing a weapon. This was a big deal. A Type 2 medium drone like the TB2 has very limited carry capacity. And once you've loaded it down with all the necessary fuel, guidance, flight and communications equipment, slapping munitions on it is, nine times out of ten, one step too far. And the weapons themselves, too, are a pretty massive deal. The kind of high-accuracy smart munitions required to make sure every shot counts is expensive and hard to produce. For reference, the famous US Hellfire missile has a unit cost of around about $150,000 a pop. In fact, arming the TB2 with effective munitions was such a remarkable feat that many started to doubt if Turkey had really made it all possible by themselves. This was the beginning of a long series of revelations as to the true nature of the TB2, as in 2019 it was revealed by The Guardian that apparently a British company, EDO MBM Technology, had been providing Turkey with their Hornet system, a micropylon capable of carrying programming and deploying so-called micro-munitions, specifically the UMTAS anti-tank missile system and the MAM developed by Turkish Roketsan. This raised a great deal of ethical questions, seeing as the UK was apparently in its own way helping arm the Turkish drone program. Baikar unofficially denied these accusations, saying that the British system was essentially garbage and that Turkey had developed their own much better system. <laughs> well, um, the Guardian also showed that Turkey had bought a lot of these useless systems, but oh well, details. And that was far from the last time the TB2 would draw some controversy either, as in 2020, a TB2 was shot down and shown to have a Canadian Westcam camera system installed. Yet again, this was a rather grey area, as Canada had imposed various restrictions on the sale of military hardware to Turkey, and the sales were completely banned in 2021, to which Turkey once more responded, meh, we never needed you anyway. All in all, it would turn out that quite a lot of the TV2 was borrowed technology. The engine came from Austria and was manufactured by a company by the name of Rotax. The fuel system and the missile racks both came from the UK, the companies Undair and EDO MBM respectively. All of these companies eventually chose to end their association and business dealings with Bayraktar. And today, these components have been replaced by Turkish alternatives, like the motor being produced by Turkish Aerospace Industries, and the optical camera and fuel systems both created by Aselsan. Quite conveniently, Turkey also of course claimed that all of these foreign-made components had in reality already been replaced before the revelations were made public. Now, regardless of how much of the TB2 is actually Turkish, the fact remains that it has been effectively deployed now in multiple hot conflicts. It has flown combat missions in Libya and Syria, where despite many drones being shot down, maybe as many as 50 or 60, they proved themselves to be quite effective in terms of cost performance. For example, a TB2 is estimated to cost between one and a half to two million dollars, circa. In these conflicts, they claim to have destroyed nine Russian-made Pantsir AA systems, costing $13 million each. Even if we assume that that was all the drones destroyed, they would still be breaking even. But a much better example of the TB2's theoretical capabilities can be found in the first 
social media war. The one now a little bit forgotten about by the far bigger social media war of Ukraine. Namely, the Azerbaijan-Armenia war of 2020. But Azerbaijan used the TB2 with great success, destroying multiple tanks and artillery positions. Most notably, however, they were also shown to engage and destroy active Russian AA vehicles, giving us a taste of what was to come in Ukraine. Where well, long and strung out Russian supply columns have given the Turkish wonder weapon an unrivaled opportunity to demonstrate its capabilities. Before, during the Azerbaijan conflict, for example, it was easy to make the excuse that the drone was successful because it was engaging outdated Russian systems, usually used by poorly trained non-Russian operators. But now, what excuses do we offer? When we see Buk AAA systems destroyed whilst hiding in a wood. When we see the Bayraktar engaging Russian tanks and supply columns. Now bear in mind, the fog of war does still lay thick and heavy over Ukraine, and we will probably not learn the true extent of the effectiveness or the potential losses of the Bayraktar until many, many years after the conflict. But nevertheless, the TB2 can no longer be dismissed with the easy excuses that it was up against poorly trained or inexpertly operated anti-air systems. It is right now being used, apparently effectively, in a modern war against a highly competent modern opponent. And so whilst we might certainly raise some questions as to just how much of the TB2 is truly Turkish, we must nevertheless take our hats off to Turkey for having made, deployed and sold a cutting-edge modern weapon system that appears to be very effective, even in one of the harsher modern-day battlefields. Until next time. I've been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.